I am delighted to welcome our first speaker of our seminar series for the Center for Anti-Racism, Social Justice, and Public Health. Um, our speaker today is an associate, is a soci social epidemiologist and assistant professor at OHSU PSU School of Public Health. His applied research integrates social epidemiology, critical race theory, decolonization methods, and community-based participatory research to examine notions of place, embodiment, and placemaking in community and development, making use of information and community technologies to de democratize research and practice. I'm going to allow him to talk about all of his great work. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Ryan Pettyway. Um, so welcome. And let's probably talk a little louder. Okay. Where do my sit? Is they all in the ceiling? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, so welcome to everyone here, everybody joining, zooming in from online. Um, so I'm Dr. Ryan Petaway. I'm going to give you a minute to read this quote here from, from Bill Hooks. It's going to be the grounding aspect of this, this presentation. Is your PowerPoint full screen? Um, Only because usually when it is, you don't see like the stuff at the top and stuff. It may or may not be. Let's see. Um, should, I, should, I, should I fix it? Should I, hmm? should I roll with it? Oh, no, you're fine with it. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's, let's get it going. Um, so I'm going to open us up uh, a little untraditional here because that's what I do in my scholarship. Um, trying different things. Um, I'm going to read a poem that was recently published in the International Journal of Epidemiology called Something, Something, Something by Race 2021. Keep piling our bodies upon our bodies, counting the ways we go silent. We tell them, as we've told them for decades, how to care for our limbs before they go missing, how to listen to our lungs and hear the words we push from our scratched throats before the fluid and smoke and scar tissue eat our air eye. Imagine our pleas smell like necrotic nakshampa cones, wisp of a godless prayer that twists into a line of least squares. Fade. Spectacular. Black to something decidedly ordinary. Oh, how quickly we learn to hang degrees on drywall, how to squeeze our lives into starved models, stripped Naked for the pleasure of a statistician's lusting parsimonious eyes, finding findings found within findings founded upon foundations found before one could find a spice or a continent to mash. Our bodies, cornerstoned in our cause, remains lost. A death with no preceding life is a birth, is it not? Perhaps if we stack our bodies high enough, we can ask the sun not to make us so stackable, so Beautiful on paper. Welcome to uh, People's Social Epi Theory and Methods for an Anti Racist and Decolonized Future of Radical Possibility. So, what I'm going to try to do here, uh, as always, putting 100 slides worth of information into what should be 30 slides for the time that I have. Um, I'm going to start us with some background in terms of my grounding, in terms of uh, power and knowledge production as it's relevant to health equity research specifically racial health equity research. Uh, I'll talk about uh, power knowledge production and epistemic violence. There will be some F words in this talk, um, one of which will be Foucault. The others, you'll, you'll hear them when you hear them. Uh, then I'll move into the idea of a people social epi, uh, the roots of the framework, uh, and then kind of some updated and revisited aspects of the framework as I've kind of evolved it uh, and grown my work over the years. And then uh, I'll go into poetry as a part of that people social epi framework. Um, poetry as Praxis in the Public Health Poetry Project, and then hopefully some time for discussion and questions. I tried to build in like 20 minutes. Um, I talk really fast. I probably go on lots of tangents, co-tangents, co-secrets, and all those things in my talks. So um, yeah, I like to be interrupted with questions. Um, I know it's going to be a little bit different because of the setup here, but uh, otherwise we'll just take for the end. Okay, so uh, first off, uh, as promised, first F word, Foucault. Um, I think it's important to start here because I think it's unfortunate 
that, uh, you know, in the context of doing research on health inequalities, racial health inequalities, right, very seldom do we ask questions about power within knowledge production processes, right? We just inherit a set of tools and methodologies that have been handed to us when we walk into like Epi 101, Public Health 101, we get to grad school, and we don't think about anything about the science behind knowledge production or the theory uh, regarding power and knowledge production. And so unfortunate, if I was running a school of public health or I was running uh, CIF, it would be a requirement that every graduate student in public health has to take a class on the theories of power and knowledge production. And so for me, it's important that I ground my work in those aspects, because as a social epidemiologist, something I realized is that uh, social epidemiology actually isn't very social at all. It's actually quite private, quite elitist. Um, and so if we want to think about why that is and why it is that certain folks in social epidemiology or in epidemiology and public health in general are producing knowledge about other folks who they are not necessarily from the same communities, why is it that they have the power to tell those stories versus the people being able to tell their own stories? We have to talk about power and what that means for public health knowledge production. So in this context, Foucault talks about this relationship between repressive power and productive power. Uh, briefly here to oversimplify, Impressive power, we can see this in public health um, in the sense that in most public health research, the community residents have to speak through the credentialed researcher. So there's an outside researcher that determines a set of questions to ask, and then they go out to the community only to have those questions responded to. So they've already engaged in repressive power by basically not allowing people to speak for themselves. They have to speak through what's been filtered and pre-decided through survey questions, right? That's also simultaneously a form of productive power, because now the only thing we'll ever know about this community is what a credential outside researcher decided was important to ask. So if we've repressed the community's ability to actually introduce themselves into the knowledge world, and we're also producing them into existence based on what we decided as outsiders um, would be the, the most relevant questions to ask them uh, in the research process. We also see repressive power and protective power and determinations of what is worthy of being studied in terms of health equity research, what gets funded, what doesn't get funded. That's repressive and productive power. We see in peer review processes, we have folks that are not necessarily representative of the communities being studied, deciding what makes it out into publication. That's repressive power because it's basically saying certain things cannot actually get out to the scientific knowledge world, and it's productive power by only allowing certain things to make it through that gate, right? So the context of social epi, um, place-based uh, place -based research, what I focus on, we see that there's most often, um, almost overwhelmingly, uh, a narrative of risk, being at risk and vulnerability and fearing worse than when you start talking about communities of color, right? Like how many of you can go into your latest public health syllabus and control find for the word black and find it associated with a word that's not saying something about at risk or being vulnerable, right? The narratives of racial health inequalities that have been put out there always center on deficits, overwhelmingly center on deficits and vulnerability and ideas of risk that are uncritical, right? And part of that's because if that's a, uh, an expression of repressive power, there's no narratives of joy and resistance, right? There's narratives of deficits only that make it through the gate, right? Uh, so part of this process entails this idea of producing discrete and knowable scientific objects through a ritual that is controlled by those that are privileged. Um, objects here, things like uh, odds ratios, relative risk, things of that nature that we can discreetly codify and show our knowledge through this positivist, reductionist lens, right? Uh, and then the rituals for doing that, right? The sets of methodologies that we use, right? The ritual of setting out for peer review, uh, publication is not legit knowledge unless it's been peer reviewed and it's been published and people can go and find it, right? Um, the ritual of becoming a credential part of that research knowledge production apparatus, right, through this process um, um, where we produce those who are privileged to be able to engage in the research process. We see all of these things happen recursively within the field of public health. Um, for me, I make no separation, uh, or I make very little separation between these concepts that Foucault talks about and what Zuberi and Bonilla Silver have talked about in the context of white logics and white methods. Um, this context in which white supremacy is defined with techniques and processes of reasoning about social facts. Uh, that assumes a historical posture that grants eternal object objectivity to the views of elite whites and condemns the views of non-whites to perpetual subjectivity. Uh, and part of what they're getting at here is the idea of the white scientific gaze. The methods that we have inherited from generations ago and we're applying them to everything that we study, not asking about who's directing the gaze and who they're writing for, producing knowledge for, right? Um, I think that, you know, Dr. Goodman herself has kind of exposed this, right? This is an example of how repressive and productive are working in the context of public health science and knowledge production, right? Um, the undeniable and overwhelming whiteness of our science and knowledge production enterprise, right? Whether we're studying asthma, uh, whether we're start studying heart disease, whether we're start studying uh, air pollution, it doesn't really matter what it is. At the end of the day, uh, less than 6% of tenure track public health faculty, based on this study, are black, less than 6% Latinx, and 0.3% indigenous for a landmass that is should be 100% indigenous historically, right? What does that mean in terms of the knowledge that we're producing and the folks that are being studied the most that are most burdened by social inequality are the least ones represented to produce knowledge about their own existences right 
Uh, this is true for editorial boards, overwhelmingly white, and also 88% straight. What does that mean for research on, with, uh, within queer, uh, queer communities, LGBT communities? Uh, and then grant review boards, only 11% from unrepresented backgrounds, right? Repressive and productive power represented manifests undeniably within uh, underrepresentation within our field. So for me, this raises concerns about this notion of epistemic violence uh, from black feminist philosopher Chrissy Dotson. Uh, this idea that when you're speaking from the margins, from a marginalized social position, that whatever knowledge you're going to share can be a form of risky testimony because you're going to be surrounded by folks who may not take you seriously or would be keen to dismiss what you're articulating because it challenges what they've already been trained or conditioned to know, right? And so this notion of testimony, uh, testimonial quieting, um, as she describes, is when an audience fails to engage a speaker as a knower, uh, essentially showing up from the margins, trying to speak your knowledge to the world, to the room, to the classroom, to your, uh, your peers at a conference, or you're trying to get a paper published in the journal, and you're essentially quieted. Uh, those folks are looking at your work, your knowledge, your ideas, and saying that they're not actually worth knowing. They're dismissing what you're trying to put out to the world, right? You're basically saying your testimony here uh, and this knowledge exchange uh, opportunity um, is, is not worth listening to, essentially, right? And so the question I would ask um, to uh, researchers of color, faculty of color, uh, researchers that are from the LGBT community, um, how often is it that we are subjected to these practices of quieting on our journey to be accepted or be able to move within this space? As we move from, as Bill Hook says, from margin to center, how many of us are repeatedly through our training, through undergrad, through grad school, through doctorate programs, subjected to the forces of quieting? Folks trying to basically say that what we are bringing to the table is not necessarily worth engaging, right? So this leads to the second element here of testimonial smothering, which is essentially where folks that are speaking from the margins learn to essentially smother their own testimony. Uh, their own testimony. They've learned how to play the game, right? They know what the ritual is now. And if they want to become a part of the privilege, there's certain things that they can say that as acceptable forms of knowledge expression or acceptable forms of knowledge, and certain things that are not going to be accepted, right? So we learn to smother our own testimonies. And then this last, uh, this relates to the last point, which I think is a significant concern in terms of advancing health equity, anti-racist decolonizing discourse for public health going forward, is that imagine multiple generations of this happening within classroom, uh, classroom spaces and professional spaces in public health, and what that means for the future public health workforce. If folks are being quieted repeatedly, if they're learning to smother their own testimony, then we're producing a future of testimonial incompetence, right? Why would we expect somebody who is trying to go out and advance health equity within various marginalized, excluded, and oppressed communities to be able to engage uh, an authentic, respectful way with those communities and within those communities if they've never learned to actually hear the testimonies from those communities as a part of the training. They're testimony incompetent. They're incapable of doing the work of health equity and social justice in the community. They've been trained to ignore those knowledges and those ways of knowing. Um, cool. So theory, uh, for the most part, is out of the way. Y'all can breathe, um, take a breath. Um, I want to pause for questions, but if there's no questions, I'll just let y'all read this as we transition. We can barely recognize ourselves through the representation. How many of y'all know what you look like in a fully adjusted model? What do our communities look like in fully adjusted models? What does that even mean? What does that representation mean? Just a rhetorical question. We'll come back to it, maybe. Uh, so a people's social epi towards this idea of challenging misrepresentation uh, and then representation and resistance. Can we engage social epi uh, research more critically, more inclusively, and in a fashion that's actually quite more social uh, other than a name? So in developing this framework, uh, this is just a list of theories and concepts that inform my work. Uh, Rearticulation and counter narrative from Antonio Gramsci's uh, work in critical theory, uh, equal social theory, of course. Um, from my memory right now, I believe this theoretical framework from social epi equal social theory is the only one to explicitly acknowledge um, knowledge production as a part of the, the, the theory around public health, right? This idea of agency and accountability. Um, within this uh, pathways of embodiment, right? That actually gives that knowledge production. Like, what does it mean that social epi doesn't have any critical engagement with the production of knowledge of social conditions as a part of the theoretical frameworks? Uh, CBPR, popular epi, uh, information communication technologies, and specifically within that field, um, I draw quite a bit from uh, notions of liberation technology and deliberation technology, the ways in which we can engage technology. Um, and ICT devices to for the, the work of liberation or deliberation to deliberate. Uh, decolon uh, not decolonizing methods, of course, uh, feminist and black feminist theory. Um, 
Audrey Lord, Bell Hooks, uh, and then uh, those, those are the two that I draw from quite the, uh, the most. And then critical consciousness and praxis from Ferry. Put that on the pot and reimagine what social epi could be. And so this schematic here, this framework, uh, this little gray circle here is what I describe as standard uh, social epi, that social epi that's basically extract, 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 uh, reductionist, positivist, give me your data, give me your samples, I'm gonna run off to my office, we are running regressions, I'm gonna publish a paper, you'll never know about it. And if you ever wanna see that paper and what I did to you in my fully adjusted model, you gotta pay $39.99 and read at a great level of a Fleshkin case score of 20, which is like a master's, two masters and a PhD, right? Uh, I described that as standard epi. Not to say that we should not do standard epi because there is a time and a place for all forms of epidemiological science. The question is in social epi to advance uh, health equity uh, and advance anti-racist decolonizing praxis. Is that the type of epi that's really going to move the ball forward, especially when that work is being done by mostly white scholars from high, highly educated families that are going into communities of color where they've never even stepped foot in? I don't know. I have some questions. I have some concerns. Uh, the next level up would be um, combining social epi and CBPR, and then furthermore incorporating the affordances of ICTs. And then if we could figure out a way to essentially make that default, the standardized practice, um, gets us close to a people's social epi. Um, for me as a place health scholar, I think that there's uh, a place for this, specifically in research, social epi research that is focused on particular neighborhoods or geographic locations. Just because of the nature of community engaged work, you need to be uh, a part of the community. You need to be embedded in that community. You need to be ideally from that community, of the community, not just hopping in to get some data and leaving that community, right? So I think that place health research is really a place where I see uh, this framework being most uh, potentially generative. Um, and as I mentioned with my colleagues in the 2019 paper, um, what we had before us is an opportunity to remix and reboot social epidemiology with inclusion, equity, and action built into its fundamental operating code. It's a chance to reimagine social, to revisit and uh, recast virtual in a very paraphrased sense. Uh, what social epi needs is full and unlimited democracy, of course, Birchow being um, seen as one of those founders of the field of social epi way back in the day. Okay, so uh, place I'll scholar here, ask y'all some questions real quick. Y'all like, know y'all had a quiz to pass. We can't go forward until y'all pass this quiz. Um, so this is the map. Uh, y'all gather that by now, I'm sure. Anybody want to guess what those blue lines represent? Whole systems or something? Zoning? Nope. Anybody? Anybody? Redlining? Not redlining. Figures? You are not going to pass the final exam. Yeah, this is not going to go well for y'all. I can barely see that. Have to retake this class. <laughs> I have to retake the class. I mean, it's hard because it's, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's, 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 it's like, Will it be helpful to know what area this is, or is, is that irrelevant? Yeah. Okay. Should we just go into it? I'm okay asking for hints, right? I'll give you a hint. They're not zip codes, but they are other geographic boundaries. So maybe not legally zoned? Someone on a Zoom said highways. Nope. Are they census? <laughs> census. So who says census? Me. Yeah. They're census tracts. Tracks, yeah. Oh. These are census okay. tracts. So I was going to say maybe not like I just needed you to zone in. But maybe it's <laughs> You said they're what census, census, census tracks. tracks. So the okay. United States government office of management and budget decided to come up with a nice way to count us. Uh, we actually just went through redistricting. We just going to have implications for our work, but that's not a conversation for another day. Um, blue lines represent census tracts here. Um, this blue line is mine where I grew up where I, when I was in high school. That red triangle is my public housing community that I grew up in. As a place health scholar, what we've been conditioned to do is essentially trying to figure out a way to define place by some boundary, right? Uh, zip codes, I think, in census tracts, uh, based on a study from Arcaia in 2016, like 85% of our studies use a census tract or a zip code, something like 85%, right? Now, the thing is, if I ask y'all in this room to tell me what census tract you live in right now, none of y'all, even online right now, you'll have to do a Google search, and what you would find is that your census tract you live in right now might have been something different because it gets redistributed every 10 years, right? The point is, they're imaginary lines. Nobody that you've ever known in their life has known their fucking census tract. They're not going to know. Why would they need to know that? People know their zip codes, but the problem with zip codes is that they're apolitical. They don't align with political jurisdictions, right? So if you're mapping things based on zip codes, who's accountable for what's going in that zip code? Postal service. Your postal service. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All mail is late. Bring your mail. That's not really going much. I mean, there's a health equity argument in everything, I would say. Mail being late is one of them. Um, but the bottom line is, like, in terms of the slide, the bottom line is that we used to we use the center track to represent somebody's community space. Now, the question then becomes is, 
is this something we should be doing, right? So what it generally happened, like the, probably the most prominent study I can think of right now is the multi-ethnic uh, study of atherosclerosis. There must be like thousands of papers published on this, right? And it's based on census tracts, it's like five different cities or whatever. Um, and census tracts are census block groups or census tract clusters, things of that nature, right? But the bottom line is there's census tracts, census block groups, um, geographies that people don't even know exist, right? It's not like you walk to the end of your census tract and you bump into a wall and you're like, okay, like I can't go past that now. Census tracts in our daily lives, right? And including zip codes. But most research is on a census tract approach and they take a measure of what's going on demographically or socially, economically in a census tract, something like 45% poverty. And they say this is explaining the effect of place on health. There are, of course, more advanced ways to do this in terms of going in and doing like actual audits. Um, uh, some of the work that's coming out of Chicago and Samson's group and them have done more detailed studies. Um, but this is the general approach to place health research, right? So me, I have some questions about this, right? Like I've been side eyeing this before I could even figure out what a census tract was myself. And so at this point, the question is, why are we still doing this? Can we not reimagine another way, uh, come with another way to um, add some nuance to our studies, right? To more specifically meaning or more meaningful geographic uh, areas that we encounter. And so within a people social heavy framework, um, something popped up on screen. Within a people social heavy framework, uh, what I attempted to do was to apply it uh, in the context of place health research, drawing from place health theory and health geography theory, because in public health, there's not a whole lot of good theory about why we're using census tracts, right? It's just convenient. We have a denominator, let's run a regression, and then boom, here's your odds ratio, right? Um, so I draw from notions of relational dynamic uh, place, needs driven place in affected neighborhoods, uh, spatial polygamy, uh, and especially activity space, this idea that, you know, where we live, this is one part of a, like a node in our multi-nodal lives, right? So we're at home for a certain amount of time, then we walk to a bus stop, and we're at the bus stop waiting for 10 minutes, we're riding a bus for an hour, we get off, we walk 10 minutes through this other neighborhood, and we're at work for eight hours or whatever, and then we go to the grocery store and the park, that's an activity space. That's our daily place. Our place is not that one sense check, right? Eco-social theory, uh, space-time constraints, and then circuits and consequence of dispossession and back of Foucault's notion of biopower, um, expanding upon its idea of governmentality theory. So putting this all together again, uh, this framework for our playscape approach, uh, that is uh, a chapter forthcoming in a book that's coming out in the fall. It was a part of my original version was part of my dissertation work back in like 2016, but nobody wants to publish a 44 page paper. And so I saved it for a book because there's space, they have time for that. Um, what I want to highlight here are uh, Playscape tenets four, um, power and placemaking. Uh, oftentimes we talk about place and placemaking, but we don't talk about how place and places came about to begin with, right? We don't talk about the structural aspects, uh, spatial exclusion, um, and that the, uh, keeping in mind this idea of place is both made and remade, and both consumed and produced, and includes and excludes, right? So it's not just doing some cross-sectional research, um, but we need to be mapping power over multiple generations. And then Part six, uh, agency and placemaking. And it's something that, um, uh, something that Nancy Krieger talks about in Eco Social Theory, right? This idea of agency and accountability. If every time we do a study on place and health, we are producing, we are placemaking, right? Um, whether it's spatial stigma or just narratives of deficits. And as I talk about later in this talk, um, Catherine McKittrick, black feminist geographer, uh, these narratives of black geographic peril, right? Every time we map something, we're telling a story. And oftentimes we're telling a story about someone's neighborhood and they don't even know we're telling that story. We've never even been in that neighborhood. Like anybody right here on this call right now on this talk, listen to this talk, can go and pay $10,000 for some secondary data, pump out a model, do some geospatial analysis and say, here's a study on this neighborhood and that neighborhood is 3,000 miles away and you don't even know anybody in that neighborhood. That's the way that most place health research happens right now, right? And I think we need to fundamentally interrogate that if we care at all about equity and anti-racism, especially when we're mapping and telling stories about communities of color. Um, so putting us into practice, uh, went back home to my own neighborhood where I grew up, where I was in high school, that little sense track red triangle I showed you. Uh, this table you see here shows the health indicators from um, RWJ County Health Rankings back in 2012. I did a comparison to Pittsburgh and Steubenville in Jefferson County, uh, which is about 25, 30 minutes from, down, uh, from right outside of Pittsburgh. As you can see, the health indicators are much worse than Steubenville, Jefferson County, than they are for Pittsburgh. Um, and for context, I think I, I once saw or heard about a study um, that the life expectancy for African-American men in Pittsburgh was something like 56 or 58 years old. And then Pittsburgh is usually put up there in like the worst places to live to be black in America uh, between like Pittsburgh and Milwaukee, right? 
So this is countywide, not Pittsburgh specifically, and not just for African Americans in Pittsburgh, right? This is countywide, not Steubenville specifically, and not just for African Americans um, um, specifically in Steubenville, which is a problem because 77% of the black population in the county lives in the city, 6% of the Latinx population in the county lives in the city, and the child poverty rate is twice as high in the city as it is in the county. But there's no specific health department epidemiologist to actually do data analysis specifically for the residents of the city. So my question is, well, if overall these data are much worse in Steubenville than they are for Pittsburgh, and that's just county level, what are they actually specifically for communities of color in the city specifically? We don't know. I would suggest that's an erasure. That's a silencing of potential um, political and social equity agendas, right? Not collecting data, not having data we need to do something about it is a part of uh, repressive power. And the, the narrative that pervades is then it becomes a part of productive power. But then the data that did exist, they essentially um, went about the most racist way they could possibly do it by deracing everything that wasn't white, essentially, right? You're either white or you're not white. At the same time I was developing this work, uh, they were going through a comprehensive planning strategy. A bunch of folks got together with city planning and some consultants, and they decided that this entire part of downtown where I grew up at uh, lacked a sense of place. In the two or three years I was working on this work um, and planning, developing the work, and carrying out the work, uh, no one mentioned ever being talked to and spoken to about this idea that someone told them that their neighborhood lacked a sense of place. Another erasure. So we decided like, maybe we can do something about that. Maybe if there's no you know, Epi that's going to represent our health interests and needs. Maybe we'll do it ourselves uh, and we can engage in an intergenerational uh, CBPR study of place, embodiment, and health. I worked with youth and adults as dyads, so the adult and a child from each, uh, each unit that participated. Um, and generally, what we did is this we did photo voice, so they took photos through the photo voice methodology. We did a participatory activity space uh, process, so they would take the photo and then they would do kind of like analog on these big printout maps where they took the photo, put stickers on it. Um, and then we went into the one GIS later on. Uh, and then we did x-ray mapping, a methodology developed by Jessica Rutless, a friend colleague who's now at McGill, uh, I believe the former New York public schools teacher, also worked at Hopkins for a while. Uh, extended that work and brought it into the place health research. So they did those methods and then they created these accounts on local ground. Let me back up a little bit here. Uh, this local ground um, website, mapping website. And they would upload their data. And here's a summary of some of the things that we found. Uh, adults on the left, uh, youth on the right. So part of this is to see like folks that live in the same public housing community, what their activity spaces might entail, right? So you can see there's a lot of overlap. Um, part of this and mobility in terms of you know being low income, access to resources, transportation, the way the spatial exclusion works in geographies like this. Um, the spread is not as far and wide as you might see in a city like New York, right? Where you can hop on a train and go all over the place. Uh, but anyway, so you can see um, some uh, the general distribution of where they were taking photos at, those little squares that you see on the screen are photo, uh, locations they photograph for um, photo voice. The polygon, I should mention, is the, shape, the shaded polygon is the census tract area. So what you can see off the top is that about half of the locations that they thought were important for their health were actually outside the census tract. If you add topography to it, you start to understand why um, in part. And then you also see what you see here now with the green markers and the red markers, it's a distribution of positive and healthy place-based experiences and the negative um, place-based experiences, right? For the youth, something like 75% of the negative experiences were within the census tract, but 77% of the positive ones were outside the census tract, right? And then as you can see, spatially, like 98% of their geographic area within that census tract is like experientially irrelevant. They don't want to go there. There's not a significant moment that they indicated through this research process that that geographic area that's empty on the map mattered for their health, right? Part of the reason that uh, was missed here is that traditional place health research processes they don't tip, they don't factor in topography at all. Um, they just get some they just act like everything's flat. Uh, they also ignore the fact that there is spatial exclusion through social processes, right? So the main route to get from here up into this geographic area, if you're not driving, which these a lot of the youth obviously were not driving, um, is through this neighborhood here. And when I was in high school, um, this was notorious for a predominantly white neighborhood that would call the cops when they saw black and brown youth walking through the neighborhood. Uh, come to find out this is still a thing so people basically just not did not go through that neighborhood because they knew they would be racially um, and spatially surveilled by the white community that's up there right so there's a reason why this area is not really having much of an influence on what's going on in their lives right these are uh, i think the data elements themselves uh, in terms of the positive negative distribution within the census tracts and then overall idea that a lot half of their place-based experiences are having outside of census tracts it indicates i this concern we have in place of research regarding the specification of place health effects right and on top of that, you're missing the rich uh, social, political, geographic aspects of place 
as being more than geographic location. There are social processes that need to be explicated within our research. Um, Can I ask you a question about that? Yes. So, so we know that um, bureaucrats make census tracts, but to me it seems like there's a real difference between census tracts and neighborhoods, like how people would define their neighborhood, and have you thought about using more of a community neighborhood structure versus using government-defined census tracts? Yeah, so for me, yes, 100%. So for me, in my work, um, what I do mostly is I let the participants decide what their neighborhood is based on where they go and what they do. Um, but yeah, the social meaning that it has, right? And so, um, yes, that's my preferred approach, right? For me, with this work, it was just a matter of seeing whether or not and which capacities to do this work in this particular geographic context, whether it made sense to actually use government data at all. Because uh, we know what government data and administrative data is going to get us, right? It exposes like the limitations of using administrative data, right? And I think that this is not the first study that showed us, right? I believe some studies came out as early as like 2006, 2007 that showed people's activity spaces, right? So if you're concerned about like air quality, but you're only measuring residential air quality, but you're not measuring the air quality where they work at, then you're not going to be explaining, you know, asthma risk very well, right? Um, so for me, yes, uh, I would prefer the work of communities and have them define their geographic parameters of the neighborhood. And having said that, I think if you get 100 people that live in the same neighborhood and have them talk about what the neighborhood is, they're not going to agree on what that neighborhood is, right? Um, so I think a, for me, I think in an ideal sense, there'd be a balance of that, taking into the, the fact the cultural, social, political, spatial aspects of what feels like my neighborhood or our neighborhood, and accounting for where people go outside of that agreed upon uh, spatial structure. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, in terms of x-ray mapping, this is the worksheet that we use. And so what they would do is put stickers um, to indicate the positive and negative uh, subjective notions of embodiment for each place. So each place on that map would have one of these attached to it um, that describes what they uh, uh, articulate their bodies were experiencing when they're in that spatial location. As far as I know, this is the first and still the only qualitative assessment of the, uh, this physiological embodiment of place. So most of this work um, is basically getting a survey and some samples, some saliva, some cortisol, right? saying that like you know noise is associated with like this you know distribution of cortisol levels during sleep or something like that right um this is the first and as far as i know still the only study that showed that you can actually get that notions of embodiment place embodiment through a qualitative methodology and so this idea of geography's embodiment that came from there um i thought it was pretty important and then this infographic here is something that the, the youth researchers actually decided upon they wanted something they could share on uh, instagram and social media and so we found a way to represent what their bodies were experiencing in these different spatial domains um, the green representing their neighborhood or the, their housing community or their specific housing units. Uh, the blue here represented their, their broader neighborhood and they defined neighborhood based on where they went, not based on like the census tract. Uh, the purple represented school or work. Uh, this gray baseball looking thing or tennis ball, whatever you want to call it, was supposed to be the leisure. So the social spaces, right? Something we don't account for quite a bit in um, place of research. And then the orange is a road, it's their transit. So the time we spend in transit is a part of our place of experiences, right? So if you're on a train or on a bus or driving, sitting in traffic, uh, that needs to be accounted for within our work. And this just shows uh, the positive, negative embodiment experience they reported uh, based in our neighborhood domain. And I, I think I got, yes, I did. I got a uh, data visualization award from the American Association of Geographers, uh, American Association of Geographers uh, for this data work here. Um, and I'm kind of thinking about ways that I could you know, expand upon it and scale it up a little bit, make it more digital. Because this is uh, this is like kind of like had to be done by hand, and I love to be able to develop like something to be able to do this where it like populates automatically just based on like entering things, right? Like an app or something. I figure that out. Okay, so that comes back to this for me at least. Um, you know, they said lack of sense of place. They said there's nothing here. They said we got to do all these things, and I think that that's not true at all. Um, I think that what we're talking about and dealing with here, and I imagine it's true of uh, many other communities and neighborhoods, there's dealing with misspecification, erasure. Uh, this notion of black geographic peril. As uh, Catherine McKittrick articulates, uh, the complexity of a black sense of place, questions of encounter, practices of resistance, can be, at least conceptually, swallowed up by the very death and decay that is bolstered by the hard empirical evidence of black geographic peril. I think if you've been in public health more than 14 minutes, you know that pretty much every time you hear about a black community and black health, it's faring worse than, it's being at risk, it's being vulnerable, right? We map communities, and the black communities are the dark red spots on the map. What does dark red represent? What does red represent culturally, right? In terms of danger and stop and don't go there, right? This is how our communities are represented when we're not thinking critically about the processes of power and representation and knowledge production, right? And we just keep on reifying and fortifying this idea of black geographic peril, and there's always more to the story. 
So I think it's time that our methods and our processes and our principles change to align with what's actually going on in the ground so that we can do the empirical things consciously, and deliberately, intentionally, with care, and then add some nuance to other methodologies and processes. How am I on time? Two. Okay, got like 20 minutes? Well, seven. 10 minutes. I'm going to try to wrap up some 10 minutes. Go real fast, real fast. <laughs> um, so this is where it started. Um, something I should be completely transparent about here is this is actually kind of where, where it started, racial capitalism and uh, recolonization. Uh, an example myself of testimonial smothering, uh, when I was in my doctorate program, um, I did not feel confident or comfortable to say what I really wanted to say, to say with my chest, because I was a first-gen college student and I'm getting a doctorate at UC Berkeley, and I had some critiques of social epi, and then Dr. Len Syme, who was like seen as the godfather of social epi, is like, well, like, do you really want to lead in with that? Do you really want to, you know, you want to invite people in? Um, so my critiques, I had to kind of smother some of them because uh, I didn't feel as if it would have been a good career move to go out the gates and start calling social epidemiology, racial capitalist recolonization and structurally racist in my first work, right? Um, so I smothered part of my own testimony by excluding some of these elements from explicitly, uh, including some of my earlier work. But at the core, there's no public health conversation we can talk about in terms of health equity and not talk about anti-racism and decolonizing, right? Uh, the field is literally built on our bodies. You can't do health equity research in communities of color or queer communities and not rely on those people, those folks, rely on us in the models, right? So how is it that we've gotten so far with a multi-billion dollar enterprise and not ask questions about who's benefiting the most uh, professionally, socially, and also in terms of like uh, capital, right? Financial capital. Um, so for me, I draw quite a bit from public health critical race practices from Ford and Arian Bula's work. Um, I'll just highlight here quickly, social construction of knowledge. I think if you haven't gathered that already, then I did not do my job. Knowledge is socially contingent, socially produced. Um, and we're not talking about power, and who has power to produce or to repress in terms of representations of knowledge or what counts as knowledge is seen as legitimate knowledge. Uh, then we're not really doing our jobs as scholars, I would argue. Um, intersectionality, we need nuance. Um, we can only do so much with empirical methods, with quantitative methods, I'd say. Uh, but there has to be, always be room for disciplinary self-critique, which is what this talk is mostly is, and then also centering uh, notions of voice to center the margins. And decolonizing, um, a lot could be said about this. A quote that stands out to me that I will uh, carry with me to the very, very end um, is from Linda Smith's work, uh, the production of knowledge, new knowledge, and transformed old knowledge, ideas about the nature of knowledge and the validity of specific forms of knowledge became as much commodities of colonial exploitation as other natural resources. Um, no apologies here, but I can't help but to come to the conclusion that racial health equity research is essentially uh, an advanced way of mining communities for all their gold and gems, right? Um, what we take out, we never put back. We put them in pay for access journals. We have entire universities that are literally not going to survive without the fiscal and administrative fees. Between the lowest I've seen is 12%, and there are, I know they're higher than 40%, somewhere like 50, 55%, right? It's a multi billion dollar industry that's made off of communities of color that are being researched, right? How are we just going to continue doing this and not calling this in and thinking about a way that we can be more equitable and less uh, expropriative and extractive and less colonized with this work, right? Um, and I articulate this in a paper that just got published um, in Critical Public Health uh, a couple weeks ago now. So one of the ways I'm trying to integrate this in my work is expanding on my initial People's Social Happy Project uh, project that I did in Portland with the Y Heart program, the Youth Health Equity and Action Research Training program. This program is developed based off of training modules that I did with the earlier work uh, that I already went through. Um, working with Self Enhancement Inc., um, organ community organization, this essentially functions like a YMCA for the black for black youth in Portland. It's been there since the 80s. Uh, three goals of this is to train youth of color uh, in public health and health equity, place social determinants, and um, using a STEAM curriculum. And the hay in there is important. Um, guide them through a series of research projects, um, and then use the data in their projects to essentially inform the practice. And we've been able to do that so far through a couple projects. Um, this is just an outline of the modules that we go through for their training. Uh, I promise you, y'all, like we don't really need our community uh, collaborators to have a PhD and MPH to do this work. Like, if you want to start talking about hierarchical regression and all that, then yeah, I think I'll need a little bit more time and some resources, right? But if you just want to be able to do some, some community-engaged research that matters based on their lived and embodied experiences of what's going on and be able to bring that to a local health department, 
you don't need to have them have MPHs and PhDs, right? Uh, and so I think it's, it's possible. Um, I estimate that, you know, by the time they go through this process, they're, they've essentially um, got the training of what like a junior or a senior would have an undergraduate public health program. Um, we use participatory methods for all the projects um, and we use creative arts. And then most recently we added the decolonizing data hub that we'll be launching in the summer. Uh, and I describe in detail the first iteration of this project in the paper that just got published in International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. Um, just want to highlight here in terms of really trying to take anti-racism and decolonizing to the fullest. When I do photo voice, um, folks that are familiar with photo voice shall know that you know you do the thing, they take the pictures, they write the narratives, and then usually the research team goes into their office and they deduce the shit out of all the quotes, right? And they come back with all the themes and they say, is this correct? And the community member is like, yeah, that's correct. They ignore power. They, they mask agency, right? Um, I think that's like a very colonized way to do photo voice. It's called photo voice. Like how the hell are you going to strip voice out of the entire process on the analysis stage? So I train resident and participants uh, to do their own qualitative analysis using highlighters and, and printed paper. It can be done. It's intensive. It's time consuming. Um, it's hilarious as well when you get teenagers going through and highlighting and making all these corrections, right? It's messy. It takes time, but it can be done. We can have a fully participatory decolonized photo waste process if we're willing to, to lean into that. Uh, one of the things that we're working on right now is developing essentially like a Yelp for a place in health. Uh, so imagine like, you know, you go to a coffee shop and you're like, oh, like five star latte. Like for me, what we're concerned about is like, you know, what about the, the place-based experiences that community members are having that are supporting or taking away from the health? And one of the projects we're developing right now is coming up with a um, kind of like a Yelp for place-based racial exclusion and inclusion, right? So the spaces of love and resistance and joy versus the places of exclusion, right? So mapping out when people say like, you know, the, uh, things like everyday discrimination scale, there's no geographic specificity in there, right? It's just general. Like how is that actionable? Like if we know that there are certain parks, certain businesses, certain areas that are basically subjecting folks to these forms of exclusion, we should be able to identify those and articulate those and, and, and come up with some ideas about how we can um, offer modes of resistance. And then we um, have engaged uh, the expert mapping methodology. So this project here, that, uh, these are just uh, some images of various expert maps that they completed. Uh, for this project, it was focused on social determinants of health broadly, but something like 40 to 50 percent of the data that they brought back was based on transportation. Uh, with no prompting. It's just that just that's just kind of what came to the top for the issue that we were working with. And so we had to uh, end up having a very rich uh, kind of qualitative uh, mixed method study about their embodiment experiences related to transportation uh, in the context of, you know, um, uh, one of the core black communities in Portland and the process of gentrification and displacement, spatial dispossession that happened and forced a lot of the youth out from their communities that their parents and grandparents live in, right? So they're going back and forth in multiple spaces uh, multiple times a week, right? So what does that mean in terms of their transportation experiences as they go through multiple um, you know, spatial environments? Um, and working in the arts, uh, working with Sharia Town. If y'all don't know Sharia Town's work, she's dope. Google her, look her up. Okay. So last but not least, um, I would acknowledge. Um, so this is kind of where it's at. I'm dropping poetry in here now. I've um, gotten bold enough, no more uh, testimonial smothering on my behalf ever going forward. I'm going to say everything I intend to say, the way I meant to say it, with my full chest. I said what I said, I'm going to keep saying it. Um, part of the issue within knowledge production is that we've decided there are certain forms of knowledge and knowledge expression and curation that are like normalized, right? We don't ask questions about that. Uh, poetry has been left off and I can't think of a reason like why, like well, how is it that we decide that poetry has no place in public health, right? And so I'm making the argument that um, not only can poetry be an interpretive tool, but it can be a tool for uh, public health knowledge protection. So I started do uh, doing this and bringing it more forward uh, back in 2020 when I wrote this paper in Health Education and Behavior, uh, which got their Paper of the Year Award. Um, and then I, at the same the time that they got published, I had this Poetry as Practice paper under review. Um, and when it dropped, it kind of outlined the framework for why I was engaging poetry. So that the poem first piece actually came out before like the reason, does that make sense? Like I was trying to like make an argument. So I feel like as a scholar, you gotta like prove your point, make an argument before someone will publish a poem. Um, but H, A, and B, they took a risk and they published it and they got the paper of the year award. So I was like, okay, like there's an appetite for this. Clearly folks wanna engage this as part of the health equity discourse. Um, but the paper making the argument for it actually came out after it. And it also got the paper of the year award. So now I'm convinced after that, I was like, okay, now I'm convinced that folks have been waiting for this for a very long time. Like, why have we not gone uh, out and tried to do this, right? Um, but I think it's for me, I got to back up a little bit, right? So um, none of this, like I'm not here as a scholar right now um, without 
poetry, without rap, without nods, right? I learned how to do qualitative analysis of neighborhoods and health by listening to nods on the back of a project bench, uh, drinking orange drink and eating hot fries, right? So for me, when folks are talking about my neighborhood and these maps that look like this, right? And what this map shows is my old census tract and a probability that if you're African-American and poor, the chances that when you're born in the 80s, you're African-American, you grow up poor, the chances that you're in the top 20% of income as an adult. Um, Quite literally, a Drake started from the bottom now I'm here story. And all they were talking about is this low probability, less than 1% chance that I essentially be where I am right now based on their math, right? What they were missing though is that there was more than just that dark red spot on the map and less than 1% probability, right? This is me and some of my homies. There was a whole lot of chilling, a whole lot of joy, a whole lot of love in this space, right? Which is partly why I'm here. Um, my, my pops and my two brothers, and for y'all, y'all get the special picture of my mom's Mercury Sable with the one remaining hubcap. Y'all no, got the good side. Um, there was a lot going on in that space that cannot be captured um, by these maps that we keep on showing, right? These these uh, these maps of black geographic parallel that McKittree talks about, right? So for me, um, they're talking about lacking a sense of place. I know that's not true. I had to go out and prove it. I had to get credentialed to become a part of the privilege for folks to understand that this is not, there's not a lack of place, uh, sense of place here. What's lacking is our imagination. What's lacking is our care and caution when we choose our methods and our engagement processes, right? That's what's lacking. We need to work on ourselves to stop mapping deficits. That's what we need to do. Um, so for me, it's important that I acknowledge this, right? This poem does not happen. Um, I'm not here, probably giving this talk um, without Nas Illmatic album cover. Like this is an homage. For me to do this is recalling back to the fact that like I started doing this research when I was 12, sitting on a project bench, drinking orange drink, eating hot fries. And my question to y'all is, what are we missing out right now? We're in New York City, like the ground, like the, this is where hip hop started, where poetry really started spoken word, slam poetry, right? How many people are here right now in New York City sitting on a project bench doing their own qualitative play self analyses that we're going to exclude from the space because they can't do a regression? I don't know, seems fall to me. Um, so quickly to move along here, uh, I'm gonna keep doing the thing. Some examples, some things I just dropped here. Each of these uh, I think is important for two reasons. Because uh, it allows me to essentially hold this space and take up space, but it also allows me to open the space up to invite others into the space, right? Um, someone has to kind of do it, uh, so I'm doing it. I'm not the best that ever did it. Uh, I'm not even, probably not even that good at it, to be quite honest with it with you. Like, sometimes I write poems, I look at them like the next day and I'm like, this is trash, why did they publish that? But hey. Um, so we're building this work into the work that I'm doing right now with the People's Social Happy Project in Portland, working with uh, SEI and also Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon to do poetry workshops and poetry competitions um, and developing chat books for them. And then also launching the first ever standing section in a public health journal for poetry as scholarship and public health scholarship through poetry uh, with uh, some dope collaborators, co-conspirators, Dr. Lacante Dill and Shanae Birch. Uh, call, open call should be coming soon. So if you're watching on Zoom, y'all some writers, get at home for your poetry. Uh, closing thoughts, uh, we just need to be more deliberate and explicit about our epistemic values, um, consider procedural data and distributed justice. If we're talking about anti-racism and decolonizing, then we cannot do that without centering the margins, and we're not going to arrive there without continually um, engaging in disciplinary self-critique. We just can't, we can't act as if what we're doing is great. Um, it's good in some areas, it can be better, we shouldn't be afraid to, to call that in and, and work harder. And for me, I think if we're uh, going to do this work, uh, I do believe that taking a people's social happy framework and approach uh, could help us do that. And I'll stop right there. So I guess my first thought is that there's some new technology that I'm super excited about that basically allow you to use census data, but draw your own boundaries and then we'll give you estimate. Because I think part of the reason why people use census data, because that's how the data is collected, right? And that's lazy, I don't want to say lazy, but you know, like we use what's available, we're doing the secondary data. But I do think some of this new technology is really cool in terms of being able to take that data and slice it and dice it in ways that I think are more meaningful to us. And I wanted to know if you'd um, encountered any of those new tools. Um, I haven't used them yet. There's a couple I've been looking at. Uh, I think Fulcrum is one of these apps I've seen out there. And then there's Trouble Toolbox that has some of these geospatial tools. I haven't used them yet. Uh, I think one of the other ones, Magpie, I want to say, um, but they're app formats and you can do some of these things where you can kind of draw them, right? That's partly why I use the local ground. Um, it was in beta mode. Uh, Professor Tavon Park um, at UC Berkeley had developed that site with his research team. 
and it was more amenable to that. And part of the reason I chose that was because you could, uh, the maps you would print had barcodes, so you can draw on the maps exactly what you wanted and scan a barcode and it would upload what you drew on a map. And then it would get embedded digitally, right? Um, so that was a dope technology that, um, that really got me thinking about that, but I hadn't seen one and or used one um, from start to finish in any of my work yet. But I do think you're right, like that's where it would be. Because like, it's not that those shadows and distracts are limited, but they're also valuable, right? We still use them, right? I think Dr. Krieger has a paper on about like the value of sentence tracks, right, and how important it is. Um, but I do think, and I think I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Uh, Joyce Moon earlier earlier about this, is that oftentimes what we need to do is be able to map things at more politically relevant uh, jurisdictions, so like city council districts, things of that nature, right? But we don't have denominators for those. Um, so if there's technologies out there that allow us to estimate what that denominator might be, yeah, that's definitely one of the ways for it, for sure. I don't know if anyone awesome. can see the Zoom. Um, yeah, I was going to say, so if anyone has any questions, like, feel free to either unmute yourself if you want to talk or pop some questions into the chat and uh, we will share them so that way you can get some questions answered. People are saying that's excellent, brilliant work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. They want your slides. Who is this? Yeah, I signed an extra magazine. This is Anya, Anya S. I don't know if you remember them. Um, oh, yeah, see? This is why I gotta show up and just do things, <laughs> right? Just made my month. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Oh, isn't that like a little full circle moment, right? It is. <laughs> I feel like I'm being punked right now. Like, <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? If anyone wants to unmute or, I mean, or even like any comments or anything like that, uh, we just want to open up the floor. We have about five more minutes, so feel free. We have, we have a good bit of people in the room. If y'all don't ask questions, I'm going to keep going, so I'm trying to be nice. You know, I always say when people don't have questions, it's usually because they got all the information that they need. Yeah, I left it, you know. Sometimes that's the case. Or they just felt the mic drop and they just. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so I actually am someone who has probably critiqued and, you know, I call myself an anti academic because I just <laughs> have not subscribed to the ways. So, if you could build, if you could build social epi the way you wanted it to be, what would that look like for you? I mean, in part, a lot like what I described here. I think that. Um, yeah, no. No, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I think part of it is like, um, I think that we need to keep obviously like the empirical things, right? Like, I think that part of my training was, you know, multi level modeling, things of that nature. I think they're really important. My find to be more important when you're trying to compare jurisdictions to spatial areas, right? Um, I think that uh, I haven't seen any evidence to show that uh, the science we produce through those methods is more likely to change social systems or structures, right? So, the example I always have is like, you know, like black maternal child health. Like, there must be thousands of papers in. You know, things are not necessarily better than they were when the first paper got published, right? And so it's like, it's not that we don't keep doing that work. Um, there's always going to be an impact. But I think that short of having evidence that this is exactly what needs to get done to change policy and social systems, I think that for me as a place health scholar, as a social epi, um, we can keep doing those things, but we don't necessarily need to compare one neighborhood to the next neighborhood. Sometimes we need to figure out how we can make this neighborhood better. And so I think a lot of those advanced uh, methods are really only necessary if you're looking for generalized patterns, right? Establishing the baseline science. I think that we've already established enough research to show what's associated with what and what the risks are for certain things and certain other things, right? There's obviously like um, plenty of exceptions to that. Um, so for me, with social epi, I think it really is uh, taking it from 90% empirical and you know flipping it kind of like uh, healthcare and public health. We spend 90% on treating sick folks and 10% on prevention. I feel like we need to flip it in social epi and move from 90% empirical odds ratios, relative risk, um, and do more uh, on the ground work specifically for social, like doing social epi for the people uh, in their communities, training their residents to do their own social epi work, right? And having that being able to be mapped onto their daily lives and the conditions of their daily lives, right? And that's probably why we're doing a decolonizing data hub um, and working with the local health department. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think the other part is like um, being able to go out and do things like poetry and music and arts as a part of the knowledge production and curation process, right? Because I think going, engaging in arts is already kind of health affirming anyway. Um, there's plenty of research that shows that uh, doing art and engaging in art is good for your health period. So imagine engaging in art and you're using art to actually move forward another idea, another knowledge agenda, right? So I think that's it. I also think it needs to be intergenerational. Um, most of our research, because of IRB reasons, other reasons, is done with adults. And so uh, when we talk about like life course, 
in health. Uh, we don't have a lot of good work that's actually like, you know, um, there's, there's some longitudinal studies that are happening right now, but like we don't engage youth as much in the conversations as we could be, I think. Uh, and also we don't engage, you know, folks across our life course. And so I think I'd like to see more of that uh, happening. And then, um, yeah, I think those are some of the core things. I would love to see that. I mean, I think that we can keep doing what we're doing, but how's that working out for us, y'all? Like, I mean, like it's 2022, and we're just now getting centers for anti-racism. Like, we are not moving <laughs> at a good pace. So and, it's, and, it's, and it's not because we don't have enough research. Right. Like, the lack of research isn't why we are where we are. It's the lack of, like, political will. It's insufficient social action, right? Like, the, our fear of um, trying to carry this mantle of being objective and apolitical and detached, we need a better regression. If we have a better regression, so listen, like, that's just not how the world works. It's never worked that way, right? And so I think that for me, it's about how can we keep the parts of that are good, do them with more care and intentionality, and then add something new and see if that matters more. Okay, so I guess, I guess the kind of, like, so you said that most of the data is amongst adults, right? Do you feel that in including, like, younger people, do you feel like it will, I mean, of course, it can only improve it, right? It can only offer more. But do you feel like it's going to offer us maybe some insight that we don't already have, right? Because I think there's two legs to look at it, right? Most times when people are young, of course, mentally they're influenced by their environment, their parents, their community. So oftentimes they might say things very similar to what the adults say. But then also, youths have the tendency to see things for exactly what they are, right? Their minds are not trained the way society taught them to think in the same way that adults are as they like grow and develop. Yeah. So I'm just curious if you think that by incorporating these thoughts, if it'll actually bring forth things that we haven't already seen. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's definitely nuanced too. And I, I think that some answers like, no, I don't think it'll reveal something brand new, right? Uh, I think there's a lot of work that engages youth. Um, and we understand like youth lives in these contexts, right? We understand adult lives. What we don't understand is like the very well, um, I would suggest the connection between the two. So like when I use the dyad work, um, and you kind of alluded to this, like sometimes like the youth are just gonna do, say whatever the parents do, right? Cause they're, they're a household unit, right? So there's like this, this is overlapping thing, right? Um, so I think that could be teased out more if we're doing more like same uh, same household intergenerational type work, right? Versus just like separate youth, separate adults, right? So I think they could be at, we could reveal some more in that story for that part. Um, but, and part of it for me, a large part of it is the fact that like, Doing that type of research, that is an intervention in and of itself, right? There's plenty of research on youth distraction research, why part being an intervention, right? Um, so I think that not only is it an opportunity to learn from them and their experiences, uh, it's an opportunity for them to engage in the research process. It's an opportunity to engage in a process of critical conscious development, right? Um, development of political consciousness, right? I do it part of the research process, right? And so part of it for me as an educator, as a scholar, is I, I want these youth to become the future scholars and practitioners, right? Um, and how do we do that? Um, if we're not engaging them earlier in the process. And so I think it, for me, it's a, there's a couple of reasons why I would suggest that we should do more of that. Okay, awesome. We have a question actually. So they said, could you share a bit about the barriers you've experienced in the process of introducing these alternative methodologies to the field? Oh, this is recording? Yes, it's still recording, <laughs> yeah. And this is actually from um, Anna Michelle. So she's actually one of the postbacs in the center. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, well, just, so I think that, uh, well, so one, I think in terms of like the new methods, so I would say that with um, photo voice is in a new method. It's been around for a while. I just don't think it's been used deliberately, expressly under the umbrella of like social epi. Um, there's a couple of studies that were, out, that were out there, like visual epidemiology and like spatial epi with like photographs um, and other things. So that's not a new method. Uh, I think that incorporating and matching with merging with other methods is like a new process overall. Um, Expert, so photo voice, like that's 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 easy to get through. I think there's a lot of uh, support for photo voice and respect and value for that. X-ray mapping was a bit different. The person I, that, that I know that did that, uh, as a person who developed it, was Dr. Jessica Rulis at McGill University. Um, and so I worked with her on a project when she was in Baltimore, learned about the methodology, saw how she was in her work, and for my dissertation work, I was like, oh, like I think we could actually expand this and like, you know, do it on the spatial scale or whatever, right? Um, I think that getting a publisher was in social science and medicine. Um, I definitely was, um, you know, there was not a lot of resistance to it. I think they like to engage in those kind of theory and qualitative works in that journal. So that wasn't too much, too much resistance on that. What I would say though, is with the, the poetry piece has been a bit more challenging. Um, with the exception of health education and behavior, which I submitted that um, and they reviewed it and were like, yeah, let's go with it. Um, that was an outlier. The other Poems I've had published in peer review literature. Um, uh, for the most part, it's like a back and forth with the editor for like months. 
And one of the journals, I won't name the journal, in one of the comments, they were like, well, I'm afraid that our readership won't know um, about these theories of knowledge and power. And I responded to them. I was like, well, like, what does that say about your journal? I hope that your journal would have a future wherein you can no longer characterize your readership as not knowing about theories of power and knowledge. And you're out here producing knowledge. Like, how can you sit up with a straight face and that not concern you? Um, so I think a lot of it was like making the argument and a lot of back and forth, right? And so I think it, it's definitely risky, right? Like, I think that one of the papers I submitted in like, I don't know, like July or something like that of one year, and then they get published until like a full calendar year later, in like a March, right? Like like 14 months it took to get something, right? And so it's a, it's a risky approach, but I think that um, for the most part, I think the folks have been kind of waiting for this type of scholarship, it seems like. Either that, and I don't discount this at all, or the timing was good, right? 2020 was a great time to drop a poem that had no apologies in it, right? Um, and I think that that might have been some of the momentum that I was able to um, to make the most of, I think. Well, thank you so much for opening our seminar series. Hopefully this piques those on the Zoom to come back and hear the other talks. Thank you so much uh, for speaking with us today. Thank you. Yes, and thank you everyone for joining. We really appreciate it. Please keep an eye out for our other events. You're all set. <laughs>